Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for flooding our lives with your presence. And we know, Lord, the day comes when you will flood this earth with your holy presence, Lord. And we look forward to that day. And we thank you, Lord, for all of your blessings and all that you're doing. Bless the people here today, Lord, and all those that are watching. Bless them, Lord, with your favor, with your presence, and a hope, Lord, for a future filled with your presence and your blessings. In Jesus' name. Everybody said praise the Lord. Praise Amen. Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you all again for being here. Thank you, Suzanne, for leading us in worship. Praise God. God is good. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord. <coughs> praise the Lord. Y'all ever called a psychic hotline? <laughs> Our daughter did <laughs> years ago uh, when I was pastoring in Ankeny. We were living in Ankeny at the time. I don't remember what the deal was. She had some girlfriends over and spent the night. They were like pre teens, 10, 11, 12 years old. And uh, that was when you had the phone on the wall. Remember, everybody had access to it. <laughs> yeah, they called a hotline. I don't remember what it was like 150, 200 bucks or something that, they, that cost us. As far as I know, none of it came true, except the bill. The bill. <laughs> but it made me think about the male frog that calls the psychic hotline, and the psychic tells him, you're going to meet a beautiful young girl who's going to want to know everything about you. And the frog was thrilled. He said, this is great. Am I going to meet her in a bar? Uh, the psychic says, no, in her biology class. <laughs> Remember the frogs? <laughs> Praise God. There's uh, two types of people in this world. Those who can extrapolate from incomplete data and... <laughs> Hallelujah. So we'll kind of have this science theme going today. A proton, a neutron and helium walk into a bar and order three beers. The bartender comes over to them with the three beers and he asks the proton, are you sure you're over 21? And the proton replies, I'm positive. <laughs> so the bartender gives him a beer and uh, he gives a second beer to the neutron and he says, for you, no charge. <laughs> neutron. And he throws the third beer in helium's face and helium doesn't react. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. How about the uh, photon checks into a hotel, the bellhop asks him, can I help you with your baggage? And the photon replies, I don't have any, I always travel light. <laughs> Praise God. Oh God. All right, enough of the uh, science this morning. Praise the Lord. Uh, let's, let's, Su Suzanne, let's start with Matthew chapter 8. And I want to read uh, verses 5 through 13. Matthew 8, 5 through 13. Praise the Lord. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of, kingdom, of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. So Jesus is talking to this centurion who is a Gentile, by the way. Which is why Jesus goes on to say, I've never seen this kind of faith in Israel. 
And then he goes on to say that, speaking of the kingdom, Israel, he said that all these Israelis, all these Jews coming, will be put out of the kingdom or won't have the kingdom to experience. But outsiders, Gentiles like this guy, are going to experience the kingdom. Why? Because the kingdom is about faith, something the Jews had not experienced, nor had they needed to, to be quite honest. That is, if they did what they were told to do, they got the benefits. But faith was not involved in it. Okay? So then look at Romans chapter 8 and verses 3 through 11. Romans 8, 3 through 11. So you might ask yourself, what do I believe? As Jesus said, as you believe, so shall you receive. So for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Let me just say this before we go any further. The flesh isn't necessarily sinful, it's the senses. It's the five senses. That's all that the flesh is. And that's what he's saying, that those who mind the senses, who are only really paying attention to what they can taste, touch, smell, feel, and hear, they're missing. Because to be carnally minded is death. And again, carnally minded is to be flesh minded or to be sense influenced or controlled. So to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Praise the Lord. So the carnal mind is subject to the five senses or to the intellect. That's the carnal mind. It's strictly intellectual. It's not operating from any kind of spiritual input, but just strictly from reason, from what you can receive from the sense realm. Amen? So faith and we're just reading it here, is born of the Spirit. Now, this, the, the Jews didn't have the Spirit of God, although it moved upon certain individuals, priests, prophets, kings. The average person never had any spiritual experience. Theirs was strictly carnal. It was all through what they received through the eye gate, the ear gate, you know, I mean, just what the law demanded, that's what they were to do. They didn't have to ha have faith. They had to be obedient. They had to be... Uh, perfect in their obedience and then they used the sacrifice for when they were would come up short so uh, faith is neither real faith now is neither intellectual nor is it anti-intellectual it just doesn't have a connection there amen it is superior to the intellect faith is superior to the intellect now your intellect will tell you just the opposite that's crazy to believe that right but the truth is because the spirit Faith is superior, amen, to the intellect. The Bible doesn't say with the mind man believes. With the heart or with the spirit. That's how we believe, praise the Lord. So through faith we are able to come into agreement with the mind of God. When we submit the things of God to the mind of man, when I take a promise from God and submit it to my intellect, amen, the result is unbelief and religion. That's Old Covenant. Religion is form without power. It's knowledge, but no way of putting it into action. It's having an awareness of things, but not able to take advantage of it, right? So when we submit the mind of man, when I submit my mind to the things of God, then I end up with faith and a renewed mind. Amen? The mind yeah. makes a good servant, but it makes a lousy master. Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit lives in my spirit, not in my mind. My spirit. Praise the Lord. The spirit is the place 
where we have oneness with God. Your mind will argue that all day long, and you know it, especially if you're having a bad day. Where's God? Well, God hasn't moved. He's still right there. Amen. Amen. The soul is the mind, the will, and emotions. And anything that doesn't make sense to the rational mind is in conflict, conflict with Scripture. And that was the struggle that the Jews had when Jesus showed up. Their mind had received the word. But they didn't have any faith. They didn't have any way to actualize this in a spiritual way. So they just continued to see what their intellect told them. And that's what they were demanding all the time. And that's why they didn't recognize Jesus when he showed up. Because this is a spiritual endeavor that he's involved in. He wasn't interested in the religion as such except in the way that it would point them to the spirit to the spiritual truth amen so look at this uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3 through faith we understand I can read the rest of it but you all know it anyway so it's by faith that we understand we don't understand by intellect by knowledge See, this is the problem with, uh, with our universities that teach, uh, well, they, they're supposedly teaching religion, but actually they're teaching secular humanism and using religion as a way of uh, arguing it, you know. So the truth is, we don't understand religion through intellect. You can study religion from now till Jesus comes back, mm -hmm. but that isn't going to make you spiritual. Because how many of you all know professors who taught religion, but weren't even born again. Didn't even believe in a born again experience. Didn't believe in healing. Don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Don't believe in any of the spiritual truths that we take for granted, right? Yeah. They've got a lot of knowledge. They just don't have any spiritual insight or revelation. Amen? So by faith, it's by faith that we understand. Faith is the foundation for true intellectualism. Praise the Lord. Because now you can rise above what your mind can know. Amen. Otherwise, you're limited only to intellect, to what your IQ is or what you're able to perceive intellectually, right? That's why faith takes us beyond that. You can be, you can be illiterate. Amen? David said, I'm wiser than all my teachers. Didn't mean, didn't mean that he had more intellect than his teachers. It just mean that he had a place to draw from that they didn't have. He could take the wisdom the intellect and combine that with the spirit of God and now he's wiser than all the teachers now he sees the real truth behind what it is they're teaching this is why we have moral laws that we try to pass and for good reason because we have issues the problem is you can't you can't use intellect to get a person to do the right thing you got to touch them somehow their heart their spirit has to be touched Amen. And we're trying to lock people up and throw away the key and treat them like, uh, you know, same class citizens and everything else because they've got issues. Give me a break. Most of us that aren't in jail are just there because we're luck are not there because we were lucky. We didn't get caught. <laughs> You're all looking at me like, man, what did he do? I can't even tell you how many times I should have gone to jail. I mean, I didn't kill anybody per se, but, you know, uh, I did a lot of stupid things that I could have gone to jail for and maybe should have. Things that I know of people that are in jail today for. I didn't, didn't get caught. Doesn't make me better than them, just makes me lucky. Just makes me being in the right place at the right time or having some lucky break, you know, somehow, some way. But it's by faith that we understand, amen, when we learn to learn that way. Are you with me? When we learn to learn by the Spirit and not by our intellect, amen, that's, that's when we open ourselves up to grow in real faith. Because it, then the Spirit begins to dominate our thinking. So that my thinking doesn't dominate the Spirit. So my thinking doesn't say, that's impossible, Nathan. How many times have you needed that and it never happened? You didn't get it. It didn't come through for you. Or it didn't work out for you. No, it's when I begin to learn by the Spirit that then my intellect becomes ser servant to the Spirit. It becomes subject, in other words, to the Spirit. Amen? Because here's the deal. Real faith doesn't require understanding to function. 
Now that sounds like an oxymoron. It sounds like it just doesn't make sense. But the truth is, real faith, true faith, it doesn't require any knowledge for it to work. Praise God. You don't have to have, you don't have to understand how this thing's going to work out for you to believe it'll work out. Amen. But the more you try to figure out how it's going to happen, the more impossible it seems to become, right? Yes. It's, an, it's, a, it's counterproductive. It fights against itself. So the best thing you can do is to turn off any part of your mind that is not renewed to the promise yes. and focus on the promise. And your mind, if we learn to learn this way, eventually the mind will become subject to the Spirit. It'll automatically line up with whatever the Spirit's saying. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. See, this is the issue that we have with children and grandchildren. Because they have needs. They'll have needs all of their life, the same as we've had. Now, they'll be saved and they'll go to heaven. But if they don't get this kind of understanding, they go through their whole life as though they were not saved. They've got to die to, be, to benefit from it. When God wants them to have exceeding abundantly above all they can ask or think right here and right now. He wants them healed. He wants them whole. He wants them delivered. He wants their children to be whole. He wants their children's children to be delivered and to be whole. Amen? And it doesn't happen simply because we have a knowledge of God or an intellectual acceptance of God. Yes, you can go to heaven that way because all you've got to do to go to heaven is believe. What must I do? What must we do to be saved? The, dis the, the disciples uh, the, the people said to the disciples, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it, believe. Paul and, and Silas, when they were in prison, the, the place shakes, the uh, jailer screams, are you there? Are you still there? They said, yes. And he said, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You and your house yes. shall be saved. So you just got to believe. You don't have to understand all the theology. You don't have to have all the ins and outs of it. The more, if you have it, it's good. It's, the, the more you have, the better it is because it helps to renew your mind. But the truth is you don't have to understand it to, be, to, to receive the blessing. Amen. So who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Jane said this, and we've all experienced this too. We've read it and thought, I have no idea what I just read. I don't even know what he's trying to say here. Right? Have you ever had scripture, you read it, and you just think, I don't get that. It just doesn't make sense. Well, then another time you read it and you go, aha, light bulb goes off. Well, the Spirit's quickened it to you, and you understand it. But for people who are not exposed to this on a regular basis, it is like reading a foreign language, especially if you're reading the King James. I mean, it'll, it'll wear you out just getting the STs on the end of every word that you speak, you know. So, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not the letter, but the Spirit. Yeah. Amen. So when we learn to receive from the Spirit, our minds become the student, and so therefore become subject to the Holy Spirit, thus influencing the mind. Am I making sense to you? See, we've made, we've made the... Uh, We've made ourselves the student. The fact is, our mind is the student and our spirit is the teacher. But we think because we're 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, whatever we are, we think, okay, well now, I know it. I know enough. I know, I know all that there is to know or I know enough about what there is to know. And the truth is, I just got a bunch of information there and my spirit is trying to make it come alive so that it becomes real. So it isn't just... A textbook so it isn't just words but it's a reality it's a way that I can live my life it influences my mind so it influences the way I think if it influences the way I think it influences everything about me because I can't do anything without thinking and whatever I think is what in fact I'll end up doing right mm -hmm. so if I can get my thinking in line with the Word of God my doing will take care of itself Praise the Lord. I mean, I can act on the Word of God if I have it settled by my spirit, right? Colossians chapter 1 and verses 12 through 16. Praise the Lord. Amen. Because I know sometimes with kids, Sally's had some issues at times trying to help them to understand what it is we're talking about when we're talking about faith 
when we're talking about believing God for this or that or the other thing, and they sometimes are getting irritated because they feel like you're condescending, you know, that you're talking down to them. When in fact you're not, you're trying to bring them up, not that we're elevated above them, but just an understanding. If you Look, if you know something that somebody else doesn't know, you've got power over them, <laughs> whether you know it or not, but they know it, and they don't like it usually, especially when they, as they start to get a little older, they get into their teens and their 20s, now they want to be treated as an equal. Praise the Lord. So it's kind of touchy how you present things to them sometimes where they fear like, feel like they're being talked down to, you know, not respected or what have you, you know. Well, maybe your family's not like mine. Yeah, that's the way it works. Praise the Lord. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Praise the Lord. The unseen world has influence over the visible world. We have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness. And we've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son, which, by the way, is a kingdom of light. So if, if I don't reach for the kingdom at hand, then the realm of the darkness is ready to display its ability to influence me. It's there all the time. It's just waiting for the opportunity to have influence over me. So if I don't remain in the kingdom of light, in other words, if I don't live by that kingdom, by the promises of God and by the truth of God's word, then I only have one alternative, and that's darkness. I'm either in light or I'm in darkness. If I'm not in the light, then I'm still being influenced by the darkness. The darkness is simply non-faith. It's just operating by intellect alone. Right? And we know a lot of the stuff that we... It's, it's facts. It's factual. These statistics we get. But they don't have to be the truth. They can be facts without being true. It could be a fact and not have a true impact in my life. Right? Cancer kills. How many of y'all know there's people that have had cancer that didn't die? And for the most part, it's because they got some light. They got some revelation. They got some spiritual insight into something. It wasn't just about knowing it's possible to not die from cancer. It's about a spiritual empowering that overrides. The light overcomes the dark. The spirit overcomes the fact. The truth, which comes from darkness, or from uh, in the invisible realm, I should say, not darkness, comes here, and that is the, how the light has access into the darkness. But if we don't take advantage of the light, we're stuck with the only alternative, which is darkness, which is sickness and disease and poverty and broken relationships and all the other junk that goes with that kingdom. Automatically comes with it, right? So here's the deal. Read all of the stories of Jesus and what you find out is Jesus worked only through the Spirit of God. It's the only way he ever worked. All the way back... To, be the, to the very beginning. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word functioned by the Spirit. The Spirit hovered and He said, and it was. Came from the invisible realm into the darkness. Because it was chaos. There was darkness. It was chaos. And that Word by faith come from the Spirit and immediately light. Praise the Lord. That's how Jesus did everything. From the beginning to His... Uh, manifestation as God in the flesh and through the 33 and a half years or whatever it was of his physical earthly life, he operated that way by the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Jesus, what he was doing was causing a collision of two worlds. That's what happens in our lives when we step out in faith. We create a concussion. We create a collision between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. Amen? The light of the revelation of the Spirit of God 
released from us, invades the darkness. This is how we take territory from the enemy. We're not, we're not talking about geography as much as we are spiritual influence. So wherever there's darkness, we have the ability and we also have the command to enter into that darkness or invade that space and take it for God. This is how light will, will eventually flood the earth. The light of God will flood the darkness of this earth. Praise the Lord. Darkness always gives way to light. I heard a guy talking about this the other day. You go to the, to the store, to the hardware or Walmart or wherever you want to go, and you buy a flashlight, right? You don't buy a flash dark. Right? You don't need to because it's just wherever there isn't light, there's going to be darkness. But wherever there is darkness, if you have light, you can cause the darkness to go, to flee. The darkness will come all by itself if there isn't any light. Praise the Lord. So if I'm not living by the revelation or by the spirit, then darkness is going to influence my life all the time. Because it's all around me. I have to turn on the light. I have to live by the spirit or operate by the spirit to force the darkness away. To bring the kingdom of light to that space, to that place. Amen. That same collision between light and darkness is what happens when somebody gets healed. Light prevails. Yes. The truth overcomes the fact. It's the same thing that happens when we get a physical uh, 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 financial breakthrough. That's a collision of light and darkness. And if the light prevails, you get a financial breakthrough. If you operate by the spirit that's how your financial breakthrough comes it invades the dark space it invades the place where there's poverty because we know where god is there isn't any poverty he wants to give us exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think doesn't our heavenly father want to give us all good things praise the lord okay so when we have a Relational breakthrough, when we have a physical breakthrough, when we have a financial breakthrough, that's all, they're all the same thing. It's light invading darkness. It's the two worlds colliding. Praise the Lord. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but division. In other words, I'm, I came here because this is all dark, and I came to bring some light. If I bring light, that's going to create some division. Yeah. Now you'll know the difference between the spirit and the flesh. Because where the flesh is, it's dark. Where the spirit operates, it's light. It's revealing. It's opening up the truth of God. Amen? Praise God. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. This is the discipline, church. It isn't. The discipline is not about, you know, don't ever let a bad word come out of your mouth. Don't ever make a bad gesture. Don't ever, you know, uh, have one too many glasses of wine. Don't, you know, just don't ever do anything that's wrong. No, that's not, that's not why he came. He came to bring the Spirit and release the Spirit of God into human beings. Yes. Amen? The demand is not to do good. The demand is to believe good. Praise God. I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That was the leaven of the Pharisees. It was the mixture of law and grace. It was the mixture of the legal demands of God and the reality of God himself. He wasn't this ogre, this angry, judgmental, do it all right or I'm going to kill you. He was grace. Jesus, came. the law came by Moses, grace and truth by Jesus Christ. What the law was doing was trying to show man his inability to, to gain light on his own. No matter how much information he gets, he's still in darkness. He's got to have the light. He was the light that came into the world to lighten our darkness. So that's why we have to have light. We have to understand this has to, the only way it can work is by the Spirit. Otherwise, 
we're just religious people groping around in the dark, acting like we have something we don't have. We're just following a bunch of rules without the benefit of the Spirit. Because that's all your intellect can produce is information and darkness. It takes the Spirit to mix with that information to make it revelation, to make it to where the Spirit dominates the fact. The truth overcomes the, the natural. Yes. Amen? So, this is the... It, this is the mixture that came from what uh, Jesus called Judaizers. They presented themselves as messengers of light and righteousness. But Jesus said, you are blind leaders of the blind. You're in the dark, and it's so dark you don't even know it's dark, and you're leading other people in the dark. You're not leading them to light. You're not giving them light. You're not giving them revelation. You're just teaching them how to function in the dark. Right? Amen? Have you ever got up in the middle of the night and you're kind of disoriented? You know, you wake from a sound sleep, you've got to go to the bathroom, and you get up and run into the wall or the chair or the dresser or something. You know it's there in the light. You see it and you pass by it every day long. But in the, once it becomes dark, everything becomes out of kilter. Uh, you know, I've gotten up and walked into the wall that's actually a closet, and the bathroom's over there. But I was, I was sure that when I got up, I turned the right direction. I just knew in my mind, even though I can't see anything, that I'm headed in the right direction until I run into the dresser. By that time, Sally's awake, and she can tell me, Hey, stupid, you're going the wrong direction. The bathroom's over here, you know. And, praise the Lord. Well, she probably wouldn't say stupid, because then I'd know where she was. I could hear her follow her voice, praise the Lord. But anyway. I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguile lead through his subtly, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Praise God. See, the message, the message of the Judaic or, or Hebrew uh, righteousness was Old Covenant righteousness. It was based on the knowledge of good and evil. Amen? Sin consciousness, in other words. Now think about it. Just the common sense would tell you, Jesus came and he said that you would have no more sin consciousness. Which means you can't be operating from the law of good and evil or there would be a consciousness of sin. I mean, by definition, there'd have to be, right? So that's what he's saying. I don't want you to even think that there is such a thing as sin. I don't, want you, I don't even want it to enter into your mind. Praise the Lord. New covenant righteousness is based on the sacrifice of Jesus and is given to us as a free gift. Period. The law placed demands on you. Grace does place no demand on you whatsoever. You only believe. It's a gift. It's free. Jesus paid for it. Hebrews 6 and 1. So he says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And here's what's interesting. You can look this up for yourself. That word perfection in the Greek is not a verb. It's a noun. A verb is an action, obviously. A noun is a person, a place, or a thing. So what he's actually saying here, when he says we must go on into this perfection, he's simply saying we have to go on into the perfect one, into Christ. We've made this about us. Yes. Go on to perfection. Get your act together. Get yourself straightened up. Quit making those mistakes. Quit getting angry. Quit getting upset. Quit allowing your flesh to take control and dominate you. No, that's not what he's talking about. He said, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, go on to perfection. That's not a verb. He's not talking about actions that you take. It's a noun. He's talking about a person, a place you go to. How, the only way we're ever going to be perfect is in Christ. Yes. That's how we become perfect in the eyes of God, by entering into Christ, by believing in Him. Praise the Lord. The perfect one. Without sin. Without 
without error. Perfect. So if the kingdom is here and now, then we've got to acknowledge it's in the invisible realm. Right? If, if the kingdom is here, as he said, the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom here, it shall be in you. Well, we know this. If it is here, if it is at hand, it's got to be invisible or we'd be seeing it, wouldn't we? Praise the Lord. So that fact that it's, it, 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 it's invisible and yet being at hand means that it's invisible, but it's within reach. You can't see it, but you have access to it by the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 4 and 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So the things that are seen are physical. They're flesh. They're sensory. The things that are not seen are spiritual. That's the light that invades the darkness. Praise the Lord. If you don't change the way you perceive things, you're going to live your whole life like the Jews of Jesus' day did. Thinking what you see in the natural is the superior reality. The temple is the superior reality. No. The temple is, a, is something in the dark pointing to the light, which is Jesus. But they never saw it. How many hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Christians live exactly the same way? They're born again, but they're going to have to die to see any light. They're still living in the darkness. They're still operating in the darkness. Without changing the way you think, you're never going to see the world that's right in front of you. Faith has its anchor in the unseen realm. If you can see it, you don't need faith for it. Right? If you can touch it and taste it and smell it, you don't need faith. You got it. Amen? Faith is the anchor. It, it lives from the invisible toward the visible, not the other way around. Because it's eternal. Everything else is going to go the way of the earth at some point. Faith actualizes what it realizes. You understand? Does that make sense to you? It makes it actual. Once you realize it. Once your faith realizes the truth, then it becomes an actual fact. It becomes reality. That's the reason we have to renew our minds. Our spirits don't have a problem with any of this. Our spirits are totally on board with it. The mixture comes when we don't have this thing renewed. It's like, it, it, it becomes like uh, uh, yeast. It becomes like something that interferes with what God is trying to get to accomplish in us. It's a mixture. In other words, of what I can rationalize and, and make sense with in my mind as opposed to what my spirit tells me is absolutely true. Well, if I don't get this renewed, then i got a mixture. I'm a double-minded man, unstable and unable to get anything that God wants to give me because it only comes one way, by faith. Praise the Lord. Can you see what I'm saying? This is the discipline. It, it, this is the thing that you have to... Discipline yourself to, to where you don't let your intellect dominate. It's good to have intellect. I mean, I'm all for high IQs and everything, but the truth is if you don't get that IQ to submit itself to the Spirit of God, it's going to be your biggest enemy. It'll kill you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. See, this is the, this is the negative about universities. I'm, I'm for education. And all that we can get, it's good. It's a, it's a good thing. But the truth is, we send our children and grandchildren and so forth off to college, they get absolutely, unless it's a Christian college, and even then there may be some question about what they're going to be learning. But for the most part, in any secular college, they're going to hear just the opposite. They're going to get smarter. They're going to get some information that's going to give them, increase their, their understanding of things. But it's an absolute detriment to the spiritual side of it. Because it elevates the mind to such a degree or to such a place of, of, of stature that we begin to look at anything spiritual as being beneath us. Only the idiots believe that stuff. Right? If, I mean, if you're really 
got an education. If you really have any IQ, you're not going to be so foolish as to believe some virgin gave birth to a God who then died for you so that you could have all things. I mean, come on. You just fell off the last turnip truck, you know. I mean, that's the, their thinking, right? I mean, with exceptions, obviously, if, if young people go there. But the, the whole deal is to get this, to get you to not operate by the spirit, but to operate by the flesh. That's the world's agenda. Anything spiritual, they're going to be against it. That's why they don't have a problem with religion. They got a problem with Jesus because he is a spirit that became flesh and still operated as a spirit, even though he was in the flesh. And they hate that because it undermines everything they're trying to do, which is control everything through the intellect. That way I can make you believe, if I can get you enough time, I can give you enough information to get you to agree with me. Even if it's not true. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. <coughs> so here's what happens. Faith provides eyes for the spirit. Just like intellect you have eyes in order to use it or to receive. Well, that's what faith does. It, it, it gives you eyes or eyes for your spirit so that you can see in the spirit realm, if you understand what I'm saying. If you think you're going to see in the spirit what you see in the natural, you're looking the wrong way. In other words, it's, it's rare that we have physical manifestations or visual manifestations, you know, other than occasionally in dreams and there are signs and wonders, but for the most part, it's a spiritual understanding, a spiritual sight that you have to have. You're not seeing with your natural eyes. But God said the problem with most of you all is you've got eyes, but you don't see because all you're seeing is what's in the natural. But if you could get your spirit to come alive, faith will give you eyes. Faith will give your spirit eyes to see. Praise the Lord. Jesus expects us to see from the Spirit. He has to because that's the way he talks to us. That's the way he teaches us. He expects us to see through the Spirit. We, we thought that, uh, and I, I've experienced a lot of times with different people, but for the most part, we thought that the ability to see in the spiritual realm is more the result of a special gift than an unused potential that everybody's got if they're a believer. So we send people off to this person or we go to see this person or we have this person pray for us or this person prophesy to us when in fact Paul said this we've all got these gifts the problem is we just don't function we just don't operate in it because we don't use faith praise the Lord so it's it's really not a gift for special people the truth is it's a gift and it's an unusual potential that every one of us have as believers we just don't do it praise the Lord the born-again experience enables us to see from the Spirit. Faith was never intended to just get us into the family of God. Faith is the nature of life in the family of God. It's how you live as a believer. Faith sees. Right? It believes what it can't see. Therefore, it sees what is invisible. It sees the healing when the healing isn't there. It sees the financial breakthrough when the finances aren't there. It sees the relation restored when the relationship is in turmoil. You see what I'm saying? That's what faith is. That's what it does. And we have to operate by it. Faith was never intended to just get us into God's family. It's the way God's family lives. It's the way it operates. It's the only way it can function. It brings all of the benefits, all of the resources of heaven. They're actuated and activated by faith. You don't get them just because they're available. You get them by faith. They've been given, but you receive them by faith. Why? Because they came from the invisible realm. You have to receive them into the visible realm by faith. Let me, I'm going to read this to you. It's the Message Bible, but I'm going to read this to you from Galatians 4, and then we'll move on from here. But tell me now, you who have become so enamored with the law, just think of this in terms of faith and works or seeing by the Spirit or seeing naturally. 
He says, you who have become so enamored with the law, have you paid close attention to that law? Abraham, remember, had two sons. One by the slave woman was born by human connivance. And one by free woman was born by God's promise. This illustrates the very thing that we're dealing with now. The two births represent two ways of being in relationship with God. One is from Mount Sinai in Arabia. It corresponds with that, what is now going on in Jerusalem. A slave life producing slaves as offspring. This is the way of Hagar. In contrast to that, there's an invisible Jerusalem, a free Jerusalem, and she is our mother. This is the way of Sarah. Remember what Isaiah wrote, rejoice, barren woman. That's the Gentiles who bear no children. Shout and cry out. Woman who has no birth pangs because the children of the barren woman, the Gentiles, now surpass the children of the chosen woman or the Hebrews or the Jews. Isn't it clear that you, like Isaac, are children of promise? Chapter 5, Christ has set us free to live a free life. So take your stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. I am emphatic about this. The moment you submit to circumcision or any other rule-keeping system, at that same moment, Christ's hard-won gift of freedom is squandered. I suspect you would never intend this, but this is what happens if you try to live by your own religious understanding instead of Jesus. And if that doesn't give you a complete picture of what Judaism was going through when Jesus showed up, and you could say by extension, much of the church. So in the Old Covenant, here's the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant is like this. This is what you think. Go back to the Old Covenant. This is what you think. The New Covenant is, I am. I know what you thought, but I am. John 6, verse 29 through 35. I'm just going to simplify this here at the last. John 6, 29 through 35. So Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? They're wanting. But they don't have any faith, do they? So the only thing they're going to see is physical stuff, is natural stuff. So that you believe on him. They said unto him, what sign are you going to show us that we can see and believe? Because that's all they know. What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and liveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So you thought manna, but I am. You see what I'm saying? He's trying to give them spiritual truth when he gave them manna. Manna is... Good, but it's not great. Man is just pointing to the reality, which is Jesus. You thought manna was the end all and the be all of this thing. You were wrong. I am. The only reason for the manna was to point you to me, the supplier of all your needs, because man does not live by manna alone or by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And here we have the word of God standing right before him. And you thought this was about some bread that came down from heaven that you didn't even like? That you called this, what is this stuff? <laughs> Praise the Lord. You thought Moses. But I am. John 8, 53 to 58. And this is religion today. We think, or the religious people, we think 
It's if I'm just be good enough. No, it's not about you being good. It's about I have already been good. I have already done everything that needs to be done. You thought it was about you doing some good. And the truth is it's about I am has already done the good. You have to believe. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Praise the Lord. Yet ye have not known him. But I know him. And I should say, I know him not. I'd be a liar, like you are. But I know him, and I keep his sayings. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Before Verily I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. You thought Abraham, but I am. I'm everything Abraham was trying to point to. You thought Moses was your deliverer, but I am delivered you. You thought you do the right thing and you'll get the right result. No, I am the one who has done all things, accomplished all things, and made all things available to you. John chapter 8, verses 3 through 11. The scribes and the Pharisees brought it unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they set, had set her in the midst, they said unto her, unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have, act, have to accuse him. They wanted to get him to break the law. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Look at verse 12, though. This is continuous writing. Remember, this is the Bible. So this, there weren't chapters and verses. The very next thing he says is, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. Why does he say that there? Because they thought the law was light. They thought the law was revelation. And they were going to use the law to kill this woman. And Jesus says, Where's your condemners? She said, I don't have anybody to condemn me. And he said, Well, I don't condemn you either. I'm the light of the world. I'm the revelation of God, not the law. I'm the reality of how God wants to deal with people, how God wants to interact with humanity. Amen? Now, this is in the context of no condemnation. How many of you know when a house gets condemned, it means it's uninhabitable? Right? If it's condemned, you can't live in it. Nobody can live in it. This is what Jesus is saying. You're not uninhabitable. I will come to you. I will not only be with you, but I shall be in you. You are not uninhabitable. Praise the Lord. Jesus says, you can be lived in, and I will be with you always. I shall be in you, and I'll never leave you or forsake you. Look at uh, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved. Praise the Lord. See, the old covenant, you studied to show yourself condemned. Under the old covenant, everywhere you look, you see why you should be condemned. Why? Because that's the purpose of the old covenant, is to bring us to the end of ourselves. To get us to see that we're failures. Jesus comes along and he said, a new covenant I'm going to give you. This is me. And you becoming one. And in this covenant, there's no condemnation. You can be lived in. And I want you to study to show that you understand you've been approved. You've been accepted. Accepted in the beloved. 
Accepted in the blood. The beloved is not the body of the family of Christ. The beloved is Jesus himself. You've been accepted in the beloved. So this goes back to the going on to perfection. Being a noun. We have been found in him. We are in Christ. We have been accepted in the beloved. Now study to show yourself approved. Quit studying to show yourself accused and guilty and ashamed and a failure, but study the scriptures in light of Christ so that you're seeing you have been approved. You have been accepted. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. This is why we don't look at the circumstance. We look at Jesus. They were always looking at the circumstance. It dictated. It dominated. It told them everything they had to know. And in fact, Jesus said, you thought Moses, but it's I am. You thought manna, it's I am. You thought Abraham, but it's I am. Quit looking at that and look here. Here's your answer. Here's your deliverance. Here's your faith. Amen. The faith of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Accepted in Christ. John 8, 12. If you can go back there, John 8, 12. He says, uh, you, I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. How do you get out of the darkness? How do you get out of the influence of the sense realm, of the intellect, of the world? By being in Christ. The light. In other words, by focusing on his truth, the light dominates. When you deviate from that, you're back in darkness again. Praise the Lord. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. He's not talking about the Jews. He's talking about the Gentiles. People that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. The Jews rejected him. They didn't see the light. All they saw was the darkness. All they... They embraced the darkness and shunned the light. And it was the Gentiles that turned to the light. That's why they are in spiritual darkness. Temporary blindness. Because he's turned to the Gentiles. He prophesied. There's some people out there that are going to see a great light. There's a bunch of people that are going to remain in darkness. But there are... Millions of people, billions of people that are going to see the light. And they're also the offspring of Abraham. Because Abraham was a Gentile before he was a Jew. He had to cross over to become the father of the Jewish nation. He was already, in his loins, was already a Gentile nation as well. Matthew 4, uh, verse 12 through 17. After they were brought to Babylon, Jeconus begat Salathiel, and Salathiel begat Zerubbabel. <coughs> Zerubbabel begat Abiad, Abiad begat Eliakim, Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Zadok, and Zadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliud. Azor begat Zadok, and I don't think we're in the right place. Uh, Sorry. Where was this uh, Matthew 4, 12 through 17. Great names, though. Uh. <laughs> Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed unto Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. 
From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, People are going to see a great light. He's saying, I'm not just, and he went on to talk about this later. He said, I'm not just the light to Israel. I am the light of the world. Yes. They, they believed that it was only about them, period. But he said, I'm not coming as a light only to Israel. I am a light of the world. The mystery that was hidden through the ages, which is Christ in you, which the Jews never experienced. Light has come, amen, enlightened our life. Praise God. So he's saying, it's Christ in you, both Jew and Gentile. Any Jew that gets saved is going to get saved the same way a Gentile got saved. So whether they build a temple or don't build a temple, and I'm not saying they won't rebuild the temple for some uh, specific reasons, but the truth is that doesn't change anything. The Jews are not going to get saved by more animal sacrifices. They're still going to have to turn to Jesus and be saved the same way a Gentile. He doesn't have a different plan for them. It's the same plan. He just turned away from them because they would not receive it. And he said temporarily blindness has come on them until he turns back to them. After the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled, he'll turn back to the Jews. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 7. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he hath set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which come out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. Praise the Lord. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sat in darkness out of the prison house. I am the light. You thought the law was the light, but I am the light. Matthew 12, verses 11 through 22. Remember, he says, Find open blind eyes, bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. And he said unto them, What man is there among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a counsel against him, how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make it known, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him, insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. He saw the light. He saw Jesus. Amen. And he was no longer in darkness. Praise God. I'm telling you, it's dark. It's dark everywhere. But the moment we turn to Jesus, light comes. Revelation comes. Healing comes. Deliverance comes. Prosperity comes. Restoration comes. It all comes from the light. Don't think you're going to take the darkness and turn it light. Jesus is the light. You just have to present Jesus. You can't make it light. But you can bring the light to where the darkness is and the darkness has to flee. And it can be light all about you. Praise the Lord. The new covenant. See, here's the deal. The new covenant was between God and God. 
Not between him and us, but between the Spirit of God and God in the flesh. Or the Father and the Son, however you want to define it. But it's, the, it's still just one God. God made a covenant with himself. Amen. And we are included in that covenant because we are in Christ. We come into Christ, we come into covenant with God. See the simplicity of it, it, it we, we make it about us, and it's not about us, it's about them. They did it, he did it. And then he just made a way for us to take advantage of it. For us to get the light into our life that otherwise we'd have no access to. This way, he also can bring both Jew and Gentile into Christ. It's not through a religion, it's through belief in the person of Christ. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 8 through 10. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare before they spring forth. I tell you of them. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise from the end of the earth. Ye that go down to the sea and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof, speaking of the Gentiles again. And God says, I'm going to give him as a covenant to all people. He is the covenant, and he's been given to us. We think of revival or a move of God or, you know, the latest, what we call a spiritual happening. And we call that a new thing. But the truth is, it's mostly not a new thing, but an old thing in a new package. Because there's only one new thing. And that one new thing is God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That's the new thing that makes all things new. Without that new thing, without that one new thing, nothing changes. But by that one new thing, everything becomes new. The new song is the new covenant. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 54 verse 1. Couple more scriptures here and we'll wrap up. Isaiah 54, verse 1. Sing, O barren. Thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. He's talking to the Gentiles. Thou that didst not travail with child, more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Let me ask you, just ask you something this morning. Is there any barrenness in your life? Is there any darkness? Is there anything where things don't grow, where things don't happen, where things don't produce the way they're supposed to? Here's God's answer. Sing a new song. Look to the new covenant. It has all your answers. Every promise, every guarantee of God is in that new covenant. Sing the new song. In other words, declare that new covenant. Declare that Christ has paid the price for you to walk in the light as he is in the light. Amen. Colossians 1, 12 and 13. Give thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Delivered from law to the government of heaven. God. Romans 7 verses 5 through 10. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve new in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. 
and the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. You thought the law was life, but I am the life. Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. John eleven twenty five, last scripture. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I don't know what you think about what you may be going through, but I know the truth. And I am is your answer. What do you believe? Praise the Lord. He is the resurrection and the life. And you have your life you live and move and have your being in that light. Praise the Lord. Everything else outside of that is darkness and death. Amen. It's just marking time until you get to the grave. This is life and that more abundantly. This is the light that he gave to come into the world to bring light where there's darkness. Praise the Lord. The light is always better and greater than the darkness. Darkness has to flee when the light shows up. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for being the light that lights our path and leads us and guides us into greater light. Hallelujah. We are a reflection of that light. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate your patience. Go in the light as he is in the light and be a light to this world. Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.